I've been getting a steady stream of questions about how I imported and purchased my little yellow devil mini skid steer, kind of cutting out the middleman and the dealers and all of that, buying it directly. So this right here is in fact a how-to video, step by step, how I got this machine, all the paperwork and filings and stuff that it took to bring a piece of heavy equipment, heavy-ish equipment, from China to here in New York State. But before I tell you all the steps, let me just say, I know there's a lot of debate out there about whether or not you should buy stuff from China. I'm not gonna really weigh in on that. I'm just gonna say, if you are looking to buy a piece of equipment from China direct, this is the way I did it. If you're looking to buy a good old Ford tractor made in the USA, just go on Craigslist. All right, so I kind of broke down my process into nine simple steps. And the first one is just to find a machine. The tricky thing here is that you're not looking for a piece of equipment that is distributed through an existing dealer network. If you're looking for a Bobcat or a Toro or a Vermeer or one of those, you just need to go to the dealer. And if you try to circumvent the dealer and go to the manufacturer, they're usually gonna tell you to find a dealer. So you're looking for a direct access to the manufacturers. You can do that through Alibaba or other B2B, business to business exchange sites, or you can do it directly. You can simply find a piece of equipment you're interested in, go to the website of the company, and sometimes you will see there is like a sales wing on that company. You can email with them, talk on WhatsApp or whatever, and work out a deal. So step one, find the equipment. Everything is negotiable as they say. And here I'm not only talking about price, but configuration. Some of these manufacturers, they make all kinds of stuff. If you want tracks instead of wheels or a different bucket or a different engine, in my case, I was looking for a Briggs and Stratton engine and these guys could easily work that out. Anyway, don't forget to negotiate and that has to do with not only price and equipment, but also timing, like how long is it gonna take to get this thing? and what port are they gonna ship it to? Spec sheets on the machine, photographs, talked about color, like all kinds of stuff. Don't skip this step, or you might realize later on that other people are getting a better deal than you are. All right, step three has to do with money and paying the people that you're working with. Uh, typically, there's some kind of down payment up front early on, and then later some kind of full payment. If you are not interested in getting scammed and ripped off, I would just kind of recommend credit card payments and going through one of those B2B uh, platforms, business to business platforms like Alibaba. There are scam stories out there on the internet about people getting ripped off on those sites. I'm not saying they're perfect, but at least there's a little bit of uh, fraud protection built into your credit card and the B2B platform just to kind of insulate you a little bit. But at some point you're gonna have to pay for this thing. Step four, line up the shipping. Maybe you did this when you were negotiating, but just make sure you understand what the shipping scenario is. You can have a shipping company take a piece of equipment from the port to your business or your house or wherever you are, but you gotta line that up ahead of time. You're gonna need to know the shipping company. In my case, with this piece of equipment, it was Vanguard Logistics, but you'll also need a shipping agent. Now, this gets a little bit funky. Basically, uh, US Customs and several of the ports have lists of shipping agents. And what those people do is they take your money to facilitate a shipping transaction. They do the paperwork, the customs paperwork, stuff I'll describe in a minute. They take care of that. You can, on the US Customs website, you can apply to become a shipping agent. You do have the option of becoming your own shipping agent and not having to hire somebody. In my case, I took the easier, probably more expensive route of hiring the shipping agent. But step four, line up the shipper. Where's this thing going? Who's your shipping agent? Get that all in a row because things are gonna get kind of complicated and you need to know that stuff before that happens. Step number five is kind of an exciting moment. It's where you get the bill of lading. Now I have no idea why they call it the bill of lading. It sounds like kind of like a decree of some kind, like some formal document, but it is a document. And basically what it does is it is sort of like assigned to your equipment and it stipulates and describes and explains exactly who made this thing. So the bill of lading 
is like the formal document that is going to travel with your equipment describing who made it, where they're located, all the specs on the manufacturer and the seller, if there's a separate seller and all that stuff. So the bill of lading is issued. You probably get it as a PDF, ask for it, some kind of electronic form, and you're gonna need that thing for everything else to progress. And number six, number six kind of caught me by surprise and stressed me out. This is when stuff gets a little bit spicy. Number six is the ISF filings. The ISF filing, as I understand it, is kind of like a customs form. It is the document that says I'm not sending all kinds of explosives or other illegal stuff that Homeland Security is not too psyched about coming into the country. So the ISF filing needs to happen before your stuff leaves the port and starts heading towards you. And I've got the specs on the ISF filing here. They need stuff like the seller buyer name, importer record number, FTZ whatever that is, uh, application identification number, consignee number or numbers, manufacturer or supplier, ship to party, that's you, country of origin, commodity harmonized tariff schedule, all kinds of stuff where at this point, having that shipping agent, that person or company you hired and you found their name on the US Customs website, having that shipping agent is kind of nice at the ISF filing point just because they kind of know what they're doing and how to make it through that document. All right, step seven is not really a step. It's more like a state of being. And it is this kind of stressful, weird experience of having your piece of equipment shipping, like in transit, on the water, in a shipping container. Now in my case, I didn't actually know where this thing was. It's possible to track shipping contain containers, I think by their number. Cause the thing about containers is that they're bugged. They've got like a little RFID encoded transponder on there. So you should be able to follow them. Anyway, your stuff is on the boat. You are now coordinating with the seller, asking them what's going on, when did you send it, all that kind of stuff, when should it arrive. You're trying to establish communication with the shipper because you're gonna to need to hear from them when this thing is delivered and you're coordinating with the shipping agent. So it's kind of this triangle trade situation where you've got the seller, manufacturer, the shipper and the shipping agent and you're just trying to figure out when is this thing arriving and who needs to do what next. And that spicy triangle trade thing finally results in the moment you've been waiting for the arrival notice. The arrival notice comes to you from the shipper. Shipper sends you the arrival notice, says, hey, your stuff is in the port. And in my case, I think I had like a day or two to pick it up before they start charging you storage at the warehouse. So you get your trailer on your truck, drive down to the warehouse. Now picking stuff up at a shipping warehouse is kind of like being a cat at a dog show or something like that. Like as a person who just shows up with a pickup truck and a trailer, you're kind of out of place because everyone else is showing up with a semi and a tractor trailer, like a big setup. So at the warehouse, you got to figure out, and I would do this over the phone ahead of time, you got to figure out if you can even pick up your equipment with a low trailer, which means you're not going to come to the semi doors. You're going to have to come around back somewhere where they can just roll up a regular door and bring things out on a pallet or with a forklift or however they're moving that thing. You've also got to bring money. So like a checkbook so you can pay the shipper, like the shipping company and probably some taxes and tariffs and custom stuff. And at the same time, make sure that your shipping agent has been paid. Without those guys getting your money, I don't think you're getting your stuff. Now, as a side note, these bills you're getting from the shipper are, are just kind of wacky. I'm just gonna read you like a couple of things they charge you for. Uh, you get a congestion surcharge, delivery authorization fee, chassis fee, in-bond PTT filing fee, terminal fee, facility administration fee, wage adjustment fee. You know, I didn't realize that if your wages got adjusted, there was a fee for that. A stripping charge. I'm not sure who's stripping or what got stripped. So, you know, it's like one of those things where a lot of different people are making money. Overall, cost-wise, I spent about 
3,000 bucks, something like that, getting the machine from China to the United States. That includes the uh, shipping company, the shipping agent, customs, all that stuff. So the equipment itself had its cost. And then for me, there was about that extra three grand. I'm sure those prices are changing all over the place. So in six months or a year, someone's watching this video. I'm guessing that person's gonna drop a comment down below and say, dude, it cost me five grand or six grand or whatever it is. So that is the story of how I did it importing this machine from China. Those are kind of like the nine steps along the way. Like I said, it doesn't have to be the way you do it, but if you decide to get some equipment and cut out that middleman and everything, you're gonna have to be able to navigate those waters. All right, I uh, seldom say this, but this has been a how-to video and I appreciate you checking it out.